Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome everyone to the Mesa City Council study session for the 1st of February. Uh, the first item on our agenda for this meeting is to review the items on the agenda for the February 5th regular council meeting. So, council, if you could please refer to that document. Um, first few items are liquor license applications followed by an off-track betting license application. We don't see that every day. So, just out of curiosity, I didn't, did, I, tell us about that. I didn't, I didn't know that we regulated off-track betting in the city of Mesa. I'm sorry to spring this on people, but I, I'm just kind of, I, I don't remember seeing this before. Is, is this the first one of these we've done or have I just not been paying attention? Well, this is not the first one that we've had. We've probably got four or five right now. Um, we do regulate off-track betting. They're able to um, share a space with a um, liquor license, a, a, a restaurant that's already there. So they do have some regulations that they have to adhere to. Okay, so they're just gonna be live streaming the Turf Paradise uh, horse races and uh, they'll be off-track betting at this, uh, at this restaurant or bar in Mesa, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, well, thank you. Like Thank you. Learned something. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, item five are various purchase contracts. Council, you may have noticed one of these purchase contracts is unusually large. That would be item 5-0. It's not every day that we have a $126 million contract that we're involved in. So uh, Beth, uh, this is our wastewater treatment plant. Again, this is one of the biggest projects, if not the biggest project the city has ever done, right? Yes, it is. Uh, Good morning. Can you update us on it a little bit? I can, if I can get the mouse to do this. <laughs> hmm. <coughs> uh, does it come up? I can't get the, is it stuck somewhere? I think we've been having some cable issues this morning. Our uh, monitor wasn't working off the bat. I can't. Oh, well. Well. Well, good morning. <laughs> I'll do it on the fly. So good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Beth Huning, and I am the city engineer. And with me on my left today, I have our water resources director, um, the amazing Jake West. <laughs> I wondered where that amazing Jake saying came from. <laughs> I'm not affiliated with that organization. Okay. <laughs> so sorry about the cable issues this morning. Carrie, uh, our, super, our boss, Carrie Kent's out of town. She left us with some sage advice. Um, <laughs> act like pros and be brief. So we're going to endeavor to do that this morning. But this is, as the mayor mentioned, our largest project here in the city of Mesa for for the history as I know it today. And it's the Greenfield Water Reclamation Plant. <laughs> the plant is actually located in the town of Gilbert and it's important to remember that this project is a partnership with two of our fellow municipalities, the town of Gilbert and the town of Queen Creek. And it's located at Gilbert and Germain Road. You may have passed it on your way down to Gilbert at different times. I'm not gonna read this slide, but um, it's important to note, people always ask, well, what capacity is the plant? We are currently at about 16 million gallons a day of uh, water that goes into the plant. We're gonna be almost doubling the capacity with this expansion that you see today. And it'll be, when we're done, we'll be just a little less than half of the total build out that's on the site. I'm not gonna read this chart either, but there are a lot of numbers. We get asked, what is Mesa's percentage of the plant? We are gonna be taking our capacity. We are not, we're just over tripling the capacity of, in this plant for a Mesa citizens for our growing um, eastern and southern part of the city with this expansion. And I think it's, uh, when we're done, we'll own about 60% of the plant, 60% right? yeah. of this expansion is gonna be due to Mesa's needs. Our ownership is based on a, a complex formula of liquid flow and concentration of the waste stream, so. The expansion schedule, uh, we were here in <coughs> September of two, last year with the first GMP, and if you drive by today, you'll see a lot of dirt flying. There's some big holes being built right now. 
Uh, we're here today to ask you to approve the second contract for with the contractor McCarthy, um, our GMP number two. That we we need to award the total contract because Mesa is the managing partner. So the total contract is 121 million. We'll be paying 72 of that million, and then uh, the town of Queen Creek and the town of Gilbert will have their portion to pay as well as part of the contract. We expect this plant to be online in summer of 2020. We need the capacity at that point, and total completion in fall of 2020. So Great. that's about it. Uh, Beth, did I hear you say that after the expansion, the plant will be at half of its total build out? So I guess we're anticipating as this, this part of Mesa or grow, or what, what's the plans for additional build out after this? Well, once this expansion is completed and as the systems grow, both not in, just in, not in Mesa, but in Gilbert and Queen Creek and the needs um, go, there's always been a plan when this first started as a lift station back in 2003, 2004, that there would be in a future uh, phase four expansion. This is phase three. So we don't have a timing of that yet. We won't know that until, you know, growth addresses itself. So this expansion and the timing of it is more to address all of the growth that's going in Gilbert, Queen Creek, Santan Valley, area in Mesa. So okay. we don't have a date or a time, but then that would be the, that would be the last expansion. We don't have any more room <coughs> after that fourth expansion. Great. But Thank you. Is, that point is it's a great regional project mm -hmm. where we've anticipated growth. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that that is the good news. And we often get asked this question on our bond ratings um, with our fi the financial uh, fi bond rating groups about our capacity to expand into the future. That's a big issue for a lot of communities. Sometimes they while they have room to grow, they don't have the infrastructure to support it. So in this um, manner, this project, as you can see, we, we can tell them not only are we expanding today, but we have the opportunity to continue to, to meet the needs of our growth in the future. Right. What, what's the service, surf, or service area for this plant? Because obviously we have another wastewater plant at the, uh, the far west end of the city. Yeah, northwest covers the central basin and central mesa, and then we have southeast that has a portion of southeast mesa, but this plant has the capacity to take everything east of the 202 along the EMI down to Germain Road. And there's another well, wastewater the plant area. in and around the Superstition Springs area? Yes, that's the southeast plant. Okay. That, that does not have solids handling. Those solids go to Greenfield, and so that's a smaller, smaller plant. But we can say it's where we're seeing the greatest growth is greatest what growth. this is handling. Great. Mr. Freeman. Thank you. I was just wondering, what do we do with the affluent? The effluent is yeah. uh, the stuff that with the Greenfield, we have a contract with the Gila River Indian community. Well, we send our effluent to, is whatever we can per our agreement to them. And we have a, a cost sharing where for every, um, I think it's for every four and five MGD of effluent we get them, we get four MGD of groundwater credits. Okay. So that's Thanks. primary. Mr. Thompson. You know, one of the, one of the questions I've asked, I've asked this before um, a long time ago, but what is the, the capacity um, on Queen Creek uh, on their portion. And, and I ask, uh, because with their development that they're doing south of Germain Road, um, putting more and more and more housings and rooftops in, uh, at some point in time, they're going to hit or exceed their capacity. And what happens when they hit or exceed their capacity? So uh, Queen Creek is uh, basically maintaining their current liquids capacity, but I think if you look at this chart that I have, they're going up quite a bit in their solids capacity. One of the things that we are experiencing in this industry, which has changed a lot over the 38 years I've dealt with projects like this, is that with the low flow water use um, fixtures that are going into residential components today, we see a lot lower gallons per day and a lot higher concentration of the waste. And I, their um, solids concentration, I think, is going up in this, in this expansion. So we're adding capacity for their solids expansion, but not for their liquid side. Um, that's where we've seen the growth in Queen Creek. But I guess to your question, this is partnership, a regional kind of has an allocation of, yes. of cost and mm -hmm. capacity. So at some point, if they maximize that, they'll have to find other options. Yes. Right now, there's within this um, expansion. expansion, they have the capacity to continue to grow. Okay. What's, uh, what's a staffing look like 
at the water treatment plant. It's housed in Gilbert, right? So. Yeah, it's at uh, Greenfield, and um, it's staffed by City of Mesa staff. And right now, we've we're recruiting for new positions because as the plant expands, we're going to need uh, more maintenance help as well as operators. So we have an active recruitment for all of our treatment plants right now because we've also got the Signal Butte plant that's going to be coming online in 2018. So it's a, it's a tight market. All the cities are competing for the same talent. So um, we're probably at about 90% at Greenfield today, uh, but we'll need to bring on additional maintenance staff as we will at some of the other plants as well. Uh, J oh, so Mesa, Mesa operates that? Mesa operates and maintains. <coughs> we We're the lead agents. We lead. operate and maintain, and we hold the contracts, and our cart partners pay into part of that. Right. So. Yeah, there's an active group agreement. agreement that allows us to allocate even the op the, not only the capital costs, but the operating costs that we incur. Yeah. Similar to the Val Vista water treatment plant in Mesa that is operated by the city of Phoenix. Yes. And we're, but we're the ones that yeah, but, we yeah. pay them. Right. And we actually, and then a lot of this waste eventually, at some port, portions of our waste is actually sent down to the, um, I don't know if we call the plant in Phoenix. Uh, 91st, 91st Avenue. 91st Avenue. Avenue. Wastewater treatment. And again, Phoenix is the operator and we pay into that. So these are the right, you know, when you get into these big plants, whether it's water treatment, especially wastewater treatment, regional facilities is really the way to go. And, and I think that's one of the strengths of this whole region is multiple cities coming together to find solutions to these um, to these issues. Well, great, thank good work. I mean, way, way to, good job to man. I, I remember there was 2014, we had about a half a billion dollar bond <coughs> that passed, and this is a big chunk of it. The other part, I'm sure we'll hear about the Signal Butte uh, water treatment yes. plant as that progresses along. Yes, it, that is too. We are supposed to turn the tap in May of this year for the Signal Butte water plant, so we'll be delivering water this summer out of that plant. Look forward to that. Mr. Thompson. And Jake, thank you and your team and Beth, your engineering uh, for the tour yesterday. We uh, It's been about oh. six or seven months since I've been out there, and it, it's gone a long way. We had uh, one of our Citizens wanted to take a tour, and so we set up a tour. So I went out with her and, and Jake's staff. Um, it's amazing um, what it that, is. how far along they've come. He keeps building it, and then he buries it and puts it underground. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> we like that stuff better. <laughs> we do. It stays we better. Do. That, it works better that way. It works better. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for the good update. So that was item 5-0 on our agenda for Monday. Any other questions about uh, any of the purchase contracts under agenda item 5? Six is taking action on resolutions. Mr. Thompson. Uh, the only question I had was on 6F. Um, when I went through the council report on the second page, description of project, um, item number five it talks about during the first 10 years with Cahoots, they'll provide uh, no fewer than 15 scholarships to Mesa High School students. <laughs> Um, the way it's worded, it almost sounds like it's strictly just like Mesa school districts. Um, oh, and so I was wondering, I was wondering city of Mesa or high schools in the city yeah, of Mesa or something. Right, that. because you know, if because if it sounds just like it's Mesa schools, well, then it leaves out the yet. Gilbert and the Queen Creek. Well, let us we'll tweak that to encompass any high school student in the city of Mesa. Awesome. Is that Thank what you're you. looking for? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, we can do that. Yes, and, and Mayor uh, Councilmember Thompson, if I can. Um, <clears throat> Cahoots is already actively working with Mesa Public Schools right now to offer 10 scholarships to get things started. Yeah, but what we need to do is connect them with Gilbert Public yeah, Schools. Yeah, because a third of Gilbert <laughs> schools are, are in Mesa, as well as uh, Queen Creek's going to be building a new high school in East Mark, so. We'll make that change. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. And uh, they'll be here on Monday, Monday okay. evening, so we can uh, talk. Great. Here, here's a spoiler alert, you guys. This 6F is a really big deal. Uh, <laughs> Cahoots is a really big deal. Yeah. So uh, I plan on uh, making a, talking a lot about it next Tuesday at the State of the City as well, just because it's the kind of thing that deserves a lot of publicity. So uh, it'll be on our agenda Monday, but then I'm, I, we're inviting them to come to the State of the City on Tuesday as well and, and explain why we're all so excited about this. So Jeff, thanks for a great job in putting this together. Tony? Congratulations. This, oh, yeah. This Tony's, will be a great... Good. Tony's brought them here, so... Yeah, Appreciate it. Along with the grid as well. And I, the, the, again, the Cahoots is moving into a $60 million development uh, at, on uh, Mesa Drive and Main Street, and that in and of itself is another very big deal that we're very excited about. Uh, 
Thanks. Uh, then agenda item seven is introducing various ordinances and eight is receiving public comment. Uh, again, right now, it doesn't look up if there's anything off the consent agenda, but uh, let us know if that changes. Next item on the agenda for this meeting is to presentations. Item 2A is to hear a presentation, discuss, and provide direction on a comprehensive <coughs> update of the city's sign code with em emphasis on portable signs. We have been looking forward to this day for, what, a, a couple of years now as our the whole sign code has been a little bit in limbo, thanks in part to our friends in Gilbert that <laughs> made their way to the United States Supreme Court, but I know it was an issue even before that. But Thank you. Please let us know what, what we have to look forward to. Thank you, Mayor. Great, and Council, great introduction. So I'm Angelica Guevara. I work in development services, and John Wesley is here also. We're, we'll both be um, providing the presentation today. So as the Mayor um, kind of indicated, we'll be focusing on portable signs today. We'll be back next week to um, give you an overview of what we're proposing for permanent signs. And so um, he kind of gave the... the um, idea away already as to why we're working on this update and it really does have to do a lot with that Supreme Court decision um, but also we, we really did need a comprehensive update our ordinance was last um, comprehensively updated in 1986 so we were due for an update um, and so some of the ob objectives that we used in this update was to reorganize the chapters and sections and update the portable sign allowances because we cannot um, regulate our allowances based on the messages that are on the signs themselves, we have to change some of those classifications. We also are updating the permanent sign allowances, with that updating the design standards and then adding in some optional sign allowances. And we'll get into the details further today and then next week as well. So, uh, Mayor and Council, as Angelica mentioned, we haven't comprehensively updated our sign code since 1986. So we've had one chapter in the, in the zoning ordinance that deals with signs and different sections have been added. And right now it's a little bit of a complicated mess to kind of work through the different provisions. So one of the main things that we're taking the opportunity to do here is to break out the ordinance into chapters and put it in a more logical sequence of events so that it'll be easier for everyone to use. So you see on the screen the chapters uh, that are being proposed uh, in the sign plan, starting with the basic introduction of why we're doing it, what we're trying to accomplish, some general procedures, moving then through the regulations from what we uh, temporary, or previously called temporary signs, now calling portable signs, then into permanent signs with uh, uh, good descriptions of each of those in the regulations, on into the prohibited. So we've covered kind of all the, the, the information about the different types of signs in those three chapters. Then we move into the processes and procedures from there, and the chapters that deal with how you get your comp sign plan, how we issue the sign permits, and how we're, we are then working with helping maintain signs and, and dealing with those types of issues in the latter chapters. Mr. Luna. On handing out, or John. Now, when we're talking about prohibited signs, it has nothing to do with the message. It has to do with the size of the right. sign? It has okay. to do with certain uh, types of signs. Again, that's, uh, what, Chapter 45? Uh, I guess I can look my notes. Uh, chapter 40, 44. 44 of the code. And so there's, there's two sections to it. Uh, one deals with specific uh, sign types that are prohibited. And another part deals with some of the locational uh, issues that go with sign uh, types and where they can't be that become prohibited. So essentially, uh, a sign is a free-for-all. You can any message. Is that right. correct? That's correct. So we can't regulate the content of the sign. We can just regulate the size and the location, and that's but correct. not the messaging. Correct. We'll get okay. into that a little bit more here as we proceed, but that's, that's correct. So in Chapter 41, just a couple of things we wanted to highlight in that introductory chapter. This is the chapter that provides us with the, the findings. Why are we doing this? What are we trying to regulate? Uh, we talk about that in 41.1 with different things. You don't want to obstruct views. We want to uh, have safety along our roadways and, and not uh, have confusing messages, uh, have visual clutter. And we get into the purpose of the code, then it responds to those findings. So we're trying to uh, you know, protect the public health, safety, wel welfare, allow for effective communication uh, by businesses and avoid that clutter and keep an aesthetic uh, roadway. In this chapter, we also talk about what the sign code does not apply to in section 41 uh, 2B. And so there's certain things, uh, addressing, you put your address on your building, not counting that towards your, your sign area. Government signs, traffic control devices, those don't count towards any type of, of uh, sign requirements. Anything authorized by state statutes uh, are not uh, uh, covered by our ordinance. Public transportation signs, uh, and other things required by our sign code. 
we are silent in our code with regard to political signs. I know that's been a little bit of an issue in the past. Uh, we're leaving that up to uh, basically the state and, and just not addressing it in our code. So with that, we're ready to move, unless there are any questions about that, going to move to Chapter 42 in the Portable Science and go into some more details about what those regulations will be. I'm, I'm sorry, John. I wrote down about five questions when you told me the five things that we're regulating here. So if you don't mind, I'll just let me just rattle them off. Uh, we talked about safety, and I know uh, more and more we're seeing uh, folks uh, asking for help, you know, in the right of way, particularly on freeway on ramps and off ramps. And I'm under the impression that that it's to, when I see that, to me, it seems like a safety issue, and I, I, I worry about these people getting hit by cars. Uh, can we regulate people uh, standing on the corners at freeway interchanges asking for assistance or, uh, for, um, for safety purposes? Mayor, that's a good question. A little bit outside, I think, directly of the sign code. Certainly the issue of sign walkers is something we don't regulate. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, again, a state statute uh, prohibition. Somebody holding a sign but is not a sign. Con Mayor, it's considered a sign walker. Okay. Right. So we regulate sign walkers under a different... We, or do we? No, we, we don't, don't be uh, a mayor and council because the state passed a statute that allowed for sign walkers. And so, um, it, it, and also because of uh, constitutional limitations on the First Amendment, the very foundation of which Reed was decided, which makes uh, the regulation of sign walkers um, uh, v very complex and difficult. Um, uh, there is at least one case in which the limitating uh, providing limitations as to people crossing or staying within medians, <coughs> narrow medians, but it's not a sign case and it's not a limitation on solicitation. And so, but uh, the ability to sort of limit solicitors and their signs um, at, at intersections uh, has been challenged and a number of cities have lost. And so uh, there are some cities that do have current codes uh, w with those type of prohibitions. Uh, I don't know how, how aggressively they enforce them um, because of potential challenges. Okay. That's what I, I thought I'd heard is that there was a First Amendment right for those folks to be there doing that. Um, I just want to confirm that that was the case. Okay. So uh, people, stand, people signs are a different issue. We're not regulating them under this code and uh, folks at freeway interchanges got that. Uh, we've heard uh, the, the small temporary signs that go up in the right of way, for example, you know, uh, real estate mogul needs apprentice, you know, guaranteed $10,000 a month, call this telephone number. I mean, those types of signs, that, and I remember Mr. Meisner, for example, had talked about having Saturday cleanup events where we go around and, and uh, pick up trucks and grab as many of those as we can. But what's the status of those types of signs? Mayor, um, council members, um, those are considered signs that are in the right of way, which um, are not allowed under the existing code, and we're proposing to keep that the same. So okay, they so would still not be allowed. Were illegal, always have been illegal, and are still illegal. Correct. Okay, so the. Because the, of their location. Not because of what they say, the right but correct. just because we, they were in the right of way. Correct. Okay, so speaking of right of way signs. You said we, we're not addressing political signs at all. So I understand that's free speech and that's even political free speech, which is about the most protected speech there is. But it, it, those of us that have been in that business in the past, there's been rules regarding when you can put those signs up, where they can go. Uh, are those rules all gone now? Mayor, council members, the regulations on political signs I pr are provided in state statutes. Our sign code will not address um, political signs. The only, um, I, the only area where we would address them is if they're placed in the right-of-way and they are creating a safety hazard. So if they're blocking visibility for drivers and there's a safety issue, then our code um, officers would be able to remove them. Okay. Otherwise, this is a state law that... Correct. Otherwise, yeah, okay. they're regulated by state statutes. And one addition on that, uh, Mayor, Mayor and Council, is it's the, the actual state statute, but both it allows it and regulates it, and the regulation on sort of the safety issues that Angelica just talked about are in the state statute. So yeah. what we're doing is in that regard is also consistent with the state statute. So uh, we will comply with the state statute. So if political signs comply with the state statute, presumably they're not going to be a safety hazard and we won't feel the need to address them. 
Just a, Christine. a quick um, comment on that, Christine Zalanko with Development Services. Um, we have worked very closely with our traffic engineers over the years to determine what is objective criteria for visibility and safety as far as distance from the roadway. We've been very consistent that it's 15 feet behind the edge of the right of way or essentially the edge of the curb. Um, so we try to educate candidates and their committees at the beginning of every political season that they need to be back 15 feet. But, and that really has been very consistent on how the city of Mesa has determined what is the safe location for a sign next to a road. Okay. So status quo, nothing changes. We're just gonna follow the, the state right, statute there. Are there other questions? Uh, okay, this morning, and for the last several mornings, I've seen at the intersection of Mesa Drive and um, Brown a large sign inviting me to run the Utah Valley Marathon in June. Uh, and so th there are, and I, I'm used to seeing marathon signs. It seems like there might be a different code for marathon signs because they're everywhere and they're uh, they're in the right of way. It appears. Uh, is it? Uh, the, is there any special rules for event signs that uh, that maybe allow this, this sign to be in, in the right of way six months prior to this event in, in another state? Mayor, Council, um, yeah. our code will regulate will not regulate political sign, sorry government speech, and so any any signs that are um, for events that are sponsored by the city would not be regulated. Um, something such as a marathon from Utah, I would imagine that the city, that is not a city-sponsored event, so therefore um, it probably would not be allowed in the right-of-way. So it would be okay. something that um, our code officers would need to address through enforcement. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll pass, I'll, I'll lodge a complaint then and see if... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Angelica. Christine, good. Come on back. <clears throat> yes, sir. So... I've had a lot of conversations with some of our constituents in D1, and some of it was about permits. I, as I read through the the uh, uh, presentation here about use permits, do we are we going to have a process even for the temporary signs, like where a person can come in, take out a permit? Could we regulate putting a permit number on there with an expiration date? And then we're talking about enforcement. I mean, do we have the capability to enforce these signs after they could be permitted? And there was other discussion about um, maybe this uh, deposit. If people are good sign putter-uppers and taker-downers, maybe they can uh, get their deposit back if we want to go that far. But there's other ideas spinning out there uh, how we can create a little revenue stream from this. So I just open up that dialogue. Uh, we have had that discussion for quite a while, and we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how in the world, quite frankly, we would administer it and enforce it. Um, to be brutally honest, we simply don't have the, the resources right now to do it. it. You know, we were talking something in the range, maybe 10 or $15 for the permit, but just the, the cost to actually issue it, track it, pull it back. Um, we, we just determined at this point in time, we, we just can't administer that kind of a program. So is there any possibility, well, with that said, then I guess they wouldn't be taking out a permit or after that? At this point in time, we do not have a, a proposal to issue specific permits. It, it really is the um, relying on whoever's putting the sign up, um, that if it's in the right location, if there's a certain amount of time allowed for it, for example, grand opening, banners and that kind of thing, um, that it's the responsibility of the owner, quite frankly, to, to take it down. We will address it from a code compliance perspective. We'll have code officers deal with it, um, but that's primarily on a complaint basis or if it is obviously falling apart, it's not in condition, it, it looks bad. Mayor, Council, to add to what Christine just said, so the majority of the portable signs will not require a permit, but there are some categories that we are currently issuing use permits for that do require a permit and that will continue to also require a permit. Some of those are banners. Mr. Luna. Uh, just something to look in the future. Um, I, I like his idea, but maybe eventually uh, put, uh, signs have a QR code that uh, residents can just 
get the QR code and send it in, say mm -hmm. this is signed legal, and that way that'd be a process of determining whether the sign is legal or not. But something we can think about in the future. Yeah, we've actually thought about that. If we, if we did issue permits, obviously we've gone yeah. electronic with just about everything. Yeah. How could we administer something like that so residents wouldn't have to come down yeah. and get a permit? But we're we're not there yet. Okay. Something Christine said a moment ago prompted a question. So it's great to have new and improved regulations, but I don't know, do we have the resources to enforce them? I mean, are, if we've got these right of way, these little right of way signs, uh, you know, that are clearly out of compliance, is it on anybody's job description to be out there doing something about it? Yes. Can you describe to me what, what is our enforcement capability? It, the current time, um, we have code officers. We also have a code supervisor. Um, when we typically see them Monday mornings. You know, they put them up Monday afternoons. We see them recently posted or attached 10 feet high on light poles and that kind of thing. That's just part of the, the regular duties of our, our code officers to, to pull those up. Um, you will be having that discussion during the um, budget presentations as to whether or not you would like to see more enforcement on those portable signs and how we could do it in the most cost-effective manner. But we are, I think, through the new boys experimenting with, I think, that, like, the college student who's going around with the supervisor. So we're trying to fi find low-cost ways to, to, to try to um, enforce the sign code. So we're looking at different ways um, to get out there. I think we've, in the past, we've had volunteer groups that have been able to, to do it. But we gotta make sure, at the same time, we also have to make sure they have the right training mm -hmm. and know what they're doing because, again, we have to be under, there's a lot of sensitivity of signs out there with the Supreme Court case. Mm -hmm. So we really have to focus on you know the location and the size and where it's at. So we're, it yep. takes uh, some level of um, training and familiarity right. with the law and we, because we have to be very careful because that's how it started in our cousins down south is that, you know, they just started enforcing it. And so we have to be very careful that we avoid those kinds of complaints. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Luna. I, I know in the past we've had <coughs> volunteers doing uh, sign pickup and stuff. Uh, do we still have that? And I, I know there were some uh, very, very passionate people, uh, very passionate trying to collect signs. And uh, uh, so in terms of volunteers and training, are we st continuing to do that? Um, quite frankly, the uh, sign code volunteer group that had been very active, um, the individuals that were extremely passionate and, and really provided the leadership got tired of doing it and notified us they were not interested in doing it anymore. That was about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, uh, we do have uh, one or two individuals that have kind of stepped back up again, new folks that are interested in volunteering their time. So we're continuing to look at that. Plus, as the city manager said, looking at low cost options, of, you know, perhaps a, a part-time person just to deal with the, um, or a contract person um, just to deal with those bandit signs. Jeremy. Have we considered doing something like the Adopt a Highway, where we basically sponsor, a, mm. you know, like a small advertisement or something for a business that agrees to keep that part of the roadway cleared of signs or anything like that? That's, that's a great idea. I'd like to look into that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. I think we interrupted you in the middle of your presentation, Angela. That's okay. Thank you. Not a great questions yes. here. So moving forward with this proposed um, sign ordinance, we're having to look at the regulations a little bit differently because in the past we used to classify the allowances based on the type of message. So if it was a development sign, a real estate sign, um, for example. And so now what we're, the way that we're moving forward is by basing the allowances on the materials, the structure type, the method that the signs are anchored or attached either to the ground or a building, and then also based on the zoning um, and the size of the lot or the parcel. And so what you see on this slide is the different types of um, portable sign types. So um, starting at the top right, we have the detached rigid signs, we have attached rigid, we'll have the rigid A-frame, semi-rigid yard sign, and then of course at the bottom left, the fabric wall banners and then the fabric detached banners. So, Mayor and Council, we want to go through and provide you some comparison of the existing code, what it would allow compared to what's being proposed in the new code, so you can see how things uh, are being impacted. Our general goal has been rough equivalency. Because of the, the change in nature of the types of signs, we can't just do direct apples to apples, but we're trying to keep things uh, as consistent as possible uh, and only modifying regulations where we think there is a real need. 
So today, uh, on a single family residential lot, a person could have, because it's by sign types by message, could have a for sale sign, could have a contractor sign. I've had somebody come work something on the house, a contractor puts a sign out, they can have an open house sign. So those are the three types of signs you could legally see in a single residence lot today. <clears throat> there are certain uh, allowances for the size of those, uh, the height of those signs. Um, individual signs could be a maximum of six foot tall, for example. We currently do not allow A-frame signs in the single family <coughs> residential area. We don't allow the banner signs or some of those other types either currently. And again, they're prohibited from being in the right of way. And so moving forward, what we're proposing in the code is to have somewhat of an equivalent allowance. And so the way that um, the code is proposed is it would allow two signs <coughs> per street frontage for each residential lot. So if a lot happens to be on a corner, yes, they would be allowed to have additional <coughs> signage than a lot that is um, surrounded by other lots. In addition to that, we're proposing a maximum aggregate sign area of 12 square feet with an individual sign being able to be up to eight square feet and six foot tall. And because they are allowed different types of signs, the detached, rigid, or the yard signs, um, and the... Um, lot would be allowed two signs, they can choose, and so what we have in the bullets here is that they could have an eight square foot um, detached rigid sign or a six square foot yard sign, but it just depends on the type that they select. Um, and then we would continue not allowing um, A-frames and not allowing signs in the right of way. Okay. What if a, an HOA has a regulation that's more or less restrictive than that? Mayor, council members, um, any any regulations by an HOA would be in addition to any regulation that the city has. So and an they HOA would be, so they could, be more, more could have a not less. HOAs could have more restrictive. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. And again, and just to remind us what we already know, this doesn't apply to political signs. That uh, presumably, is if it complies with the state statute, you could have five different political signs in your yard at any given time. Yes, okay. Mayor. And any sign, any additional okay. regulation that the HOA would impose on their. Um, property owners, they would have to enforce. The city does not enforce those restrictions. Okay. okay. So moving on to another example of a vacant piece of ground that's ready for development and the types of uh, portable signs, uh, temporary signs that could go on there. With today's code, again, they can have that real estate sign because it's a larger tract of ground in this example, 17 acres, the size of that uh, uh, real estate sign can be bigger under today's code up to uh, 24 square feet. Again, they can have uh, contractor signs uh, on the property with contractors that may be working on the, on the property. And we have two other classifications under today's code, development signs and subdivision signs that could also go on these types of uh, uh, areas. Those are typically larger signs, 32 square feet, uh, eight foot tall uh, in these areas. And so you can have that variety of signs uh, on uh, a vacant piece of property as it's going through uh, that development process today. And so moving forward with uh, the proposed code, because we're no longer able to classify those allowed signs based on the message, we're having to just have what, we've, what we've, we're calling a standard allowance and then also an undeveloped property allowance. So for this ex example, we would allow um, two standard signs under the standard allowance and two under the undeveloped property allowance. And so what we've provided here, because this uh, specific example is at Val Vista and McKellips, um, along the Val Vista Drive frontage based on the area of this property, they would be allowed <coughs> to have 80 square feet of area in signage and then on McKellips, another 80 square feet in area. Um, they, at the bottom um, on the right hand side here, I've, we've provided the um, allowable sign types, so they would be allowed to have a detached rigid, attached rigid, and semi-rigid. Depending on the types of signs that they um, are proposing to have at their property, they would be able to provide anywhere from four signs that are 32 at 32 square feet um, or four that are eight square feet and six foot tall. It just depends on how they choose to mix those um, around. One other thing, Mayor, Council, real quick on this slide. <clears throat> One of the situations we have in our current code with different message types, we've had different sign allowances in terms of size. Again, that was one of the criticisms of the, from the Reed decision, is changing those things based on the message. So we've had to standardize all of our signs, and we've picked the 32 square feet as the standard. So some of the signs that were smaller can now be larger at 32, and some that were larger at 48 are now limited to the 32. But it's standard <coughs> across the board now at the 32. So then the uh, uh, next example is a uh, commercial development example. And so here we have an existing uh, commercial pad. And so again, looking at 
a situation such as this, uh, the sign, portable sign allowances are still the same. We have the real estate sign, we have the contractor sign, we have the development and subdivision signs. So your typical commercial lot that's developed, unless you have a contractor working to do something to your building, you're putting their sign out there, uh, or you're trying to sell the property, there's really no portable sign allowance. So portable signs you may see today, advertising businesses, uh, or really what the current code provides for, but something you, you could see that Angelica will talk about under the, the new code. Um, but they could have the banner signs for the grand openings, the special events, those types of things. Well, again, that's a message-based sign, so we can't regulate them uh, uh, that way into the future. Today, it's 30-day allowance for a grand opening. Uh, so we've had to address that in the new code and how to handle those. So the way that we're moving forward is um, based on the... Um area of the property, and it would be also um, sign allowances per um, occupant. And within this example, we have a commercial development at Baseline and Ellsworth where um, there are, you know, there's a, a grocery anchor there, and then there are uh, various pad sites there. And so based on the specific acreage, they would be allowed, so when they are two acres or less, um, they would be allowed one sign per street front, um, up to 12 square foot each or 24 square foot total, and then if they are five acres or more, so for example, like the uh, grocery anchor is over six acres in this example, <coughs> um, they would be allowed three signs per street front, um, 12 square foot uh, maximum per sign, but then they could have a total of 32 square feet. Um, and they would also be allowed um, banners, whether they're wall banners or detached banners, um, and we're proposing an allowance of 45 days per calendar year. And then I've also listed the allowable sign types there that they would be allowed to have the detached rigid, the fabric wall banner, and the fabric detached banner. <clears throat> okay, I'm sorry, that does prompt a question. So uh, if you have a, a commercial center like the one that's depicted here where you've got multiple tenants, you know, it's, and none of them are gonna be five, eight, well, and, and let's say we've got a lot of turnover in this, uh, this complex. You've got six or seven grand openings a year going on. Uh, sorry, you get 45 days of banners for the entire complex for the entire year. So oh. you're going to have to allocate those 45 days among the multiple tenants? Mayor, um, council members, that 45-day um, allowance for a banner is per per tenant, so per, per occupant. Tenant. Okay. So it's not so, it's not 45 days for the entire um, complex, development yeah. site. Yeah, It's allowance so you, by property and by tenant. So you could have many months of uh, grand opening signs out in front of that complex if you've got multiple tenants that are having continuous grand openings. Uh, yes, Mayor, uh, but we also have to remember we're not regulating the message anymore, so it's not necessarily a grand opening banner. Oh, it could it's be a banner for anything. they want to put okay. on the banner. So each tenant in that large complex gets <coughs> 45 days of banner advertising out on the street frontage. That is correct, Mayor. Okay. That seems like a, a real expansion over the previous rule. If it was only previously you could get 30 days for a grand open for a specific purpose grand opening now you can have 45 days for whatever purpose you want to advertise yeah, mayor and under the existing code it was um 30 days for a grand opening for a new proprietor for change in ownership there was a couple of um, reasons why they could have a banner for 30 days so what we were trying to do is provide a somewhat equivalent um, allowance and so if Council feels that that is maybe a little too allowing a little too much. We would be happy to take those comments. We have released the draft of the sign code a couple weeks ago, and we are in the public review and comment period. So we are looking to take any feedback and comments at this time, um, so that we can come back in a couple of weeks or months with um, a final draft. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. I guess my comment would be I don't see a need to expand it from 30 days to 45 days. And I think in a large commercial complex, a large grocery store anchored complex, you literally 365 days a year, you could have multiple banners out in front of that uh, complex that interferes with the right of way and vision and other things. So Angelica, so um, my question it, uh, has to do with that, the banners and stuff. Have you cons have you asked the businesses? Is that something that they want to do, or? So, Mayor, Council, Mem uh, Vice Mayor Luna, we have actually had um, um, we had a public meeting back um, in May, April, May of last year, 
um, and we had presented um, the ideas that we were looking to move forward with as we were drafting a, a sign ordinance. Um, we've now released the actual draft now that it's been completed. We have scheduled a public meeting that we'll be holding on February 20th at 6.30 p.m. at um, Fire Station 201 at 360 East 1st Street for anybody that would like to go if they're watching. Um, and so we, we will be presenting um, what we have drafted and be looking for feedback and comments at that time as well. Thank you. Jeremy. A question on the fabric detached banners. It seems like a lot of the businesses and like some of the grocery complexes, the little ones that don't really have uh, street, like frontage road advertising, that those are up, it seems to me, like 365 days a year. So I'm assuming that this would limit them, or if we change it from 45 to 30, they could only pick 30 days out of the year to put their fabric banners on the streets, is that correct? Mayor, Council Member Whitaker, that is correct. That is what that would do. <clears throat> and have any of uh, the small businesses pushed back on that as far as like from an advertising perspective that they would be concerned like a loss of revenue? Mayor, Council Member uh, Whitaker, we have received some feedback, not specifically on this issue. Um, they were actually understanding and accepting the, what we were proposing. Um, the feedback that we received was more on the subdivision <clears throat> marketing signs. It was more from the um, the developers where we were receiving those comments. We did, um, we have reached out to the Arizona Sign Association, International Sign Association, um, and multiple stakeholders with our draft um, and are awaiting their feedback. Um, I know that several of them are working on reviewing it so that they can provide us some comments. So we're waiting to receive that. Okay. Yeah, it would just really be unfortunate if the small business owners weren't aware that the sign code was coming and then if this drastically, you know, uh, impedes their ability to market to people that they rely on driving by. So just something that I would ask that you guys keep in mind. Um, yeah, Mayor, um, Council Member Whitaker, we, we have an extensive list of stakeholders that do include a lot of um, agencies throughout the state and organizations in order to try and reach out to them. So we are seeking feedback. <clears throat> well, to that point, though, but before we get to Mr. Freeman, I think this is expanding uh, a business's ability to use that type of signage more than previously, because previously you could get, you got 30 days for a very short list of things, for a grand opening or something else. Now you get 45 days, you don't need a reason, whatever you want. So that I'm assuming it wasn't enforced before, because, I, I mean, it appears to me just by driving by multiple intersections that those fabric banners are out. I would say every single day. I don't notice that they yeah. disappear, but I'm not really paying that close attention. Yes, yeah, Mayor, Count, Councilmember Whitaker, over the last uh, year or so as we've been working on this ordinance and knowing we had the read issues to deal with, uh, we have uh, really been looking for a complaint basis to enforce those. Uh, but once we get a new ordinance, we know what the rules are again, as we've talked about previously with code compliance issues. We, we, we were step very that cautious up. about site enforcement after that case. And so we wanted to make sure we had an updated sign ordinance in place and get it in front of the council so that that would give us a little more <coughs> firmer ground in our enforcement, even with our code officers. So I think once we get this approved, it kind of provides some specific clarity within our code that we're not doing this because of the content, you know, not because of the whatever part of the fabric that's out there, but we're doing it because it's in the right of way or the distance from the curb and we'll feel, we feel like we'll be in a more, um, certain position to enforce it going forward so um, but that's it's a good point because we do get that complaint or observation that there's been a proliferation of those other uh, signs banners or those detached banners in the right of way especially on weekends and a lot of cell phone companies and other things like that so that's something we will need to pay attention to and it once it's approved i think it may be um, helpful for us um, to, as we go out and enforce it, is do a lot of education in the first few times, and then after that we'll get more aggressive in our enforcement. Yeah. And that may be one way to how we communicate this is you know, initially it may just be literally kind of a warning, and then after that we can get into the um, stronger enforcement. And we'll We're going to have a system that's going to be able to track 30 to 45. I mean, like if somebody puts out a banner the first 30 days of the year and then they go to put it up at the end of the year, you're going to be like, hey, You've had your 29 days. You've only got one day left. Like, Mayor, this... Council Member Whitaker, it's something that we're having discussions currently um, within our, with our staff, trying to determine how it is that we can um, regulate that within the existing um, system that we have. We haven't worked out the details. First, our first um, challenge was to complete a draft, which we've released for public review. We're working on trying to finalize it, and in addition to that, trying to work on the details as to how we will um, regulate some of that and just permit it if it requires a permit. 
Just a quick note of uh, clarification on that also. That's really all part of the, the bandit signs also. <clears throat> when we talk to our code enforcement folks and figuring out how we can enforce those feather signs, which really, they, what, they started proliferating five, six years ago. Um, so as the city manager said, we've been very cautious since the, the Gilbert case, um, but that's absolutely one of the things we're working with code on to try to figure out how we can <coughs> make sure that that is enforced. Yeah, well, one of the things that would be really unfortunate is if we start enforcing those, what well, you refer to them as the, the feather banners where a legitimate business has paid for rent on that corner, but we're not enforcing, or we say that we can't enforce, we don't have the power to enforce the small bandit signs that are, you know, proliferating across the entire city, right? So I would, I would just hate to see that we're enforcing more of the legitimate businesses than the ones, uh, to the mayor's point, you know, make $10,000 a week, uh, selling real estate or whatever else, you know what? I think those are a bigger problem than the legitimate businesses that are paying rent and we're collecting taxes on. And we, we're going to be very sensitive to, sure. to those issues and try to do right. Great, thank you. Mr. Freeman. How does this affect me driving around seeing my favorite mannequins on the sidewalks <laughs> going like this? <laughs> <laughs> John. Mayor, Council <laughs> Member Freeman. Is that a people sign? <laughs> I mean, they're, they're really neat out of my areas. Yeah. Yeah. So, is, it, is she going to be a bandit? Well, if she's a live person, um, she's, she's not, not regulated. No, mechanical, yeah. yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, and so those um, under the existing code are prohibited and would continue being prohibited. Okay, my, my, I'm being a little sarcastic, but that, and then the uh, wind driven uh, things that flop around in the wind and Probably you know there's a commercial about it now and I think it's kind of cute but regardless how are those affected and then again to Jeremy and the mayor's point is we get, come back to enforcement yeah you know and to regulate and I, I appreciate getting the sign code in, in, in place so that we have a template that everybody can go off of so again, the floppy things, what are they still bandits Mayor, as well? Yeah, Mayor, Council Member Freeman. So we, we consider those air activated signs and those are prohibited under the existing code and would continue to be prohibited as well. Whoa, wait a minute. Those are, uh, so there's no allowance for, the, for that type of signage at any time, at any place in our community. So if we <laughs> see it, bang, we know they're out of compliance and they can that be is correct. enforced again. So okay, didn't know that. What's the reasoning behind that? Mayor, Council Member Whitaker, they create a distraction for drivers, and so it comes from safety, and then also visually it creates clutter. Visual clutter. Yeah. Hmm. And safety. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Luna. But aren't they actually, when they put those in the actual property of the businesses? Yeah. Is uh, that Mayor, so? Vice Mayor Luna, it, it just depends. I've seen some um, out closer towards the sidewalk and the street where they're <coughs> probably in the right-of-way, and I've seen some in... Um, within parking lots, so it just depends on where they're placed. And Jessica, so, the question is, if it's on their property, are they allowed? Uh, are they considered a sign, or are they... They, they are considered if, a sign, and right now they are prohibited, and we were, are, we were proposing to keep, continue to keep those as a prohibited item. So that'll be part, uh, subject to the, the comment period that right. we're underway right now, Correct. so we'll see what kind of uh, interest there is in, in making those legal, because I guess they always have been illegal, huh? Correct, and we are here to try and receive direction, so if okay. that is something that you would like us to consider. I'm not gonna fall on my sword for those no. signs, but. Uh, but I would just say, maybe we could consider if they're not uh, close to the street, to the point, like, if they're on the rooftop. I th I'm trying to think of where I can picture one of those. I think like there's a batting cage on, like, Belvista and Southern. They don't put it on Country the- Country Club and Broadway is where I see the dancing sign, but. Yeah. So, but but the, the point is, it's still a sign. So you you, you still only get a certain amount of uh, you know of, right. of signage on your building. You can't you know add additional uh, signage to your building by attaching it to an inflatable man. Yeah. Well, and mayor and council members, one of the challenges with those types of signs is how do you calculate the area of it in order to make it equitable to everybody, and is it. So that, that would be one of the challenges with it. But like I said, if that was something that you wanted us to consider, we can we have time where we could sit there, take a look at it, analyze it, research it, and then. Thank you. Mr. Luna. Angelica, perhaps you might want to consider a time limitation. Um, to me, they're, they're not a problem. I mean, aesthetically, I mean, they, they obviously draw attention. Uh, but they're not, to me, I haven't seen them for a long period of time. I would usually see it when they're doing something special. So maybe looking at it in terms of the, the length of time, and if it's in the, within their property, why would we adjust? Why would we want to regulate that? It'll be interesting to get comments on it, Mr. Thompson. 
I'm just curious how much is going to cost us to enforce this sign code. I mean, if, if you have all these different types of banners and things you can have, things you can't have, how many people and how much is it going to cost us to enforce? Well, Mayor, Councilor Thompson, right now, most of the time with our sign code, it's done on a complaint basis. So if everybody drives by and sees the gorilla on top of the car cells, you know, and nobody complains, it doesn't. We don't kind of the idea of being proactive versus just being complaint basis. Because if we were to be proactive and just have a sign code enforcement to go through the city, um, your phones would be off the hook. So we do is we, we right now, there are times when we'll have some groups in specific <coughs> corridors where we've had recurring problems. Sometimes we'll send out a group to do that. But right now our, our kind of our um, operation and really what we can manage with resources is based on complaints. Well, and I guess that's what I'm getting at. We're, we're spending a lot of time on sign codes, but in, in the reality of it, we're gonna have a code um, one way or another. But we're really not going to enforce it unless somebody complains about it. Um, that's the majority so that's, of times that's what we, we may look at doing some proactive enforcement, like I said, in certain types of signs, maybe um, you know, we, all, we got a lot of complaints about um, freeway uh, ramp areas and things like that, which, you know, so if it's a persistent thing like that, we may be active at doing that even before get a specific complaint. But majority of the signs yeah, that's typically how we're going to respond. We don't have just a sign crew 100% of the time. We do, I think we have some supervisors and others that will do that every once in a while, but um, because we think our resources are better spent in the neighborhoods where we have complaints, where neighbors have very real concerns, health safety concerns, and that's where we'll put most of our code officers. Uh, is Go there ahead, an exception Jim. application process? Like if somebody want to put a giant grill on top of their car dealership uh, for 30 days because they had a sale, like is that something they could apply to do that's outside of the I think, so, yeah, we're, I think that's something we were well, uh, yeah. going to look at. Yeah. Mayor, Council Member Whitaker, so currently the way the code is written, the, one of the ways that we will consider um, a tailored sign plan is by having an applicant uh, file an application for a special use permit for a comprehensive sign plan. It would go to public hearing with the Board of Adjustment. That is how we consider um, alternatives to sign criteria. But that can only be considered for signs that are um, allowed. So some of those <laughs> signs that we've been talking about are prohibited, and so those we would not be able to allow them even with a comprehensive sign plan. Mm. But I think what we're hearing is you'd like us to look at some, bring back yeah. some options yeah. otherwise. Yeah. Correct, so we'll take a look for at For a limited time of the year or yeah. limited right. time. Yeah, I just think that uh, it's hard for small businesses to succeed sometimes. And if somebody wants to go buy a, you know, giant gorilla and <clears throat> stick it on top of their car dealership to capture people driving by, I, okay. I don't have an yeah. issue with that. You know, yeah. I think that's okay. Uh, another random question: uh, There are some car dealerships that I, I wonder how they stay on the ground because they've attached so many balloons, particularly on the weekends sometimes. To their car dealership is this right is that regulated at all mayor council members those balloons are prohibited under the existing code and we're proposing to continue to make them prohibited okay how, how does the proposed new code uh relate to our neighboring communities i mean are, are, are our 45 day limits going to be dramatically more or less than other communities and if i'm you know bashes or fries or i've got to keep track of oh my gosh mesa is much more restrictive or oh I'm much more lax than across the street in Tempe. Right. So, Mayor, we, we have uh, done some comparisons with the adjacent communities and how they have uh, updated their codes. And where we can, we've, we've uh, you know, tried to copy some of the things they've done. But we've also mostly found that every jurisdiction sign code is so different, it's hard to do many direct comparisons. But with a specific topic like this, it would be very easy for us to go in and look more specifically at this issue and see how they are doing them and see how we compare. Bring that back. Yeah, I'd be curious to know, just so we're in the in the ballpark, we don't want to be stick out like a sore thumb either direction, I don't think. I'm sorry, you're, you're still in the middle of your presentation. <laughs> yeah. Got a few more to go. Yeah. So <laughs> one of the other areas that we are um, looking to make some changes in is in the downtown pedestrian area. As you can see by this map, that area is bounded by Country Club, um, to Centennial Way, First Street to First Avenue. What we're proposing to do, the area within the yellow box, is expand that downtown pedestrian area from Centennial Way going east towards Mesa Drive. 
Um, the reason why we're proposing that is because this is the area of the city where we currently allow A-frame signs. And so this is the area where we're proposing to continue to allow A-frame signs. It's a pedestrian area, so it um, is more logical to have those types of signs out um, in the sidewalks to help attract attention of the businesses that are um, along those buildings. And so we're proposing to expand that just to help um, address some of the future development that we're seeing in the area. And just, and I think that's kind of how we look at our downtown anyway today, yeah. is that expanded area to country club. So. I agree. Uh, Mayor Council, this next uh, so, uh, slide deals with fabric signs. I've already pretty well covered this topic, I think, in terms of the current allowance uh, for those 30-day uh, periods and even the, the new option, but there's the, the temporary use permits maybe we haven't discussed. Correct. Um, so with the proposed code, um, we, were, we are proposing the 45 days, but we'll take a look at going down to 30, as um, you have indicated. In addition to that, though, we were <coughs> proposing to allow additional days with a temporary use permit. But we'll be considering that as well. So that would kind of go to Jeremy's point of what if I want to have, you know, can I come in and make my case for a special situation where I'd like to have more than what the, what the code allows for? Okay. Mayor, and that's how we would address it, is through the temporary use permit. All right. So, oh, Mr. Going Glover. Back to uh, Councilmember Whitaker's point, I'm like, if someone does want to put a gorilla on their building business, I don't really care, because I'm like, it's not affecting anybody. So what it, why should we regulate it for a certain amount of time? So what's the justification that you want to give for that? Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilmember Glover, I think historically, as uh, we've looked at this, because it is the current prohibition, is, uh, some concerns with these, uh, with the attention that it may uh, take from a driver trying to look at something that's uh, is unique and different as that. Uh, Wasn't that the purpose places. to draw them to that business? Yes, but in a safe way. And so I, I think that's been part of the concern. Uh, and then I think there's been some concern about uh, with some of these, the, the quality of them and the appearance that it gives in the community uh, in terms of the aesthetic impacts that it can have. Uh, I think have been probably the primary reasons why the prohibition's been there. But we, again, we'll be going back based on this uh, input we've received. We're, and I think we're going to do the that. research and see what other cities right. have done and bring that back to you. And the prohibition was also to address uh, visual clutter. If you start having portable signs, permanent signs, and then additional signs coming up of the, the roof of a building, because that's where I typically see those gorilla type signs, um, or the air activated in the parking lot, that it just starts to be a lot of signage. Um, and so that was the concern. That was the reason for the prohibition. I would almost say that if it's on your own roof, that we would just leave that alone. Because it's recessed far back in the business enough that I don't think it's going to affect. It, from my perspective, it's the stuff you see when you're driving down the side of the street. When you take your time to look away from your cell phone, right? Because that's what we're all doing anyway. <laughs> we talk about the real distractions. Another it's not the science. It's yes, uh, Mayor and Councilmember Whitaker, and we will be going back and taking a look at that. Thank you. Well, I mean, we do regulate the size of signs in our community, and every city does. And so, then, and, and this, uh, businesses would love to get more signage, right? I mean, if I could, instead, if I could get my way around the sign code by having a 20-foot inflatable sign on top of my building that said, "Come to my business," every business in town would do that, uh, particularly when you're in a retail competitive environment. So, uh, I. You know, we do have this, it's a, that's the point of having a sign code, is we, we don't just let people do whatever they want to uh, to advertise their business. There, there's, there's parameters. Balance. Yeah. Do you want to turn on your microphone and say that? I said, to me, it doesn't really matter, because if we're not enforcing it, unless somebody complains, then why have such tight restrictions? Well, Mayor, so Council Member Thompson, we do have a lot of businesses um, that, that do call, that do come into our office, that do follow the sign code. And, and, and I think we set the policy. If we want to say, hey, let's be uh, aggressive on bandit signs and let's uh, give a green light to our code enforcement guys, anytime you see a, a bandit sign okay. in the right of way, please pick it up. But uh, wait for a complaint on this category of sign. I mean, we're, that's our fault. We're the ones that are going to give these people direction as to how to enforce and when, and when to enforce it. I'm sorry. Please okay. proceed. Uh, we're ready to wrap it up. 
So our last slide here uh, is about the time frame. So we've, we've really covered a lot of this already, but just to reiterate some of it, we did issue the uh, draft sign code. It's out there, has been now for a little over a month, uh, so we can receive uh, comment feedback on it. Uh, we have a, a specific uh, meeting coming up uh, in February that we are advertising for the general public. We are reaching out to various stakeholders and encouraging them to get us their comments or to see if we can come meet with them. We're doing that over the next couple of months. We're reaching out to the advisory boards, uh, planning zoning board, uh, board of adjustment, design review board to get their uh, input, feedback on the code. As staff, we took a few weeks off of not looking at it after being immersed in it for many months. And so we're looking at it with fresh eyes. We've gone through, uh, particularly with the help of the city attorney's office, and you know, finding some of the things that, that we missed, uh, to, you know, correcting you know, some of the language and, and uh, areas where we need to tweak some things a little bit. So we know that the code we come back with ultimately for your uh, action is going to be a little bit different than today. We appreciate the comments today. We will look at, at those and uh, take them into consideration for the revisions as we go forward. We hope to be uh, at uh, PNZ in April for them to take action on it to make their recommendation onto you and then, then get it back to you uh, before you go on break, hopefully for your uh, adoption. Thank you. Council Member Heredia. Is there uh, phases of, as far as violations as listed on the, uh, what we send out? I, as far as uh, if you violate, if somebody complains, is there a series of, of different violations, a warning, or is that part of the, the packet? Yes. That's actually part of the code enforcement process, and it really isn't any different than the rest of the nuisance code on how we enforce it. Um, they, we try to talk to them. We always look for voluntary compliance if, if they won't. Um, there is a process of notices of violation and then eventually a citation, but our, our focus has always been, and from my perspective, should continue to be to, to get um, proactive sure. and voluntary okay. compliance. It is listed as far as the different steps yes. that we take? Okay. Yeah, the, um, the code enforcement officers also enforce the zoning code, mm -hmm. um, which is where the signs are, but the enforcement process itself would be the same. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. One last question, I, but I doubt that. Um, <laughs> the, the whole purpose of this is to allow businesses to come in over the counter a lot of to do this business instead of going through the Board of Adjustment and taking this off the Board of Adjustment's plate, streamlining the process mm -hmm. to allow uh, the signage to flow evenly, I guess. Yeah. Mayor, um, Council Member Freeman, there are some signs that are issued over the counter, such as the banner permits. There are some signs that do require a submittal to obtain a signed permit. So they submit their plans, they get reviewed, then they can come in and pick up their permit. And then there are some uh, developments that which wish to tailor their sign criteria to their development, which then they would be filing a special use permit application, go through public hearing through Board of Adjustment to be allowed to have that sign package. We did take a look at um, the comprehensive sign plans that we have, uh, that the Board of Adjustment has approved over the last 10, 15 years. And um, when we come back next week, we will show you some of the proposed changes that uh, we're proposing for permanent signs. So it's, it, okay, the, all of those I'll, I'll changes are in permanent signs. All right, thanks. Great. I just want to make sure that wasn't the last question. Uh, when, we, when we talk about streamlining the process, when you say people apply for a permit, do you mean like they literally have to come down here and apply for a permit? Or like they are like taking pictures and submitting them on a web interface? If I could just answer that. Um, we do have the um, DIMES program for all of our permitting. Um, virtually everything can be done online. Okay. these days so we are continuing to work with applicants whether they're for signs or for a brand new building um, that they do it all online they can pay online they they do not have to come down but well excellent but, there, but there, we but we also encourage if they need to to come down because oh, as much sure. as technology is wonderful and efficient sometimes that face-to-face -face explanation is very helpful for some of these businesses but a lot of the regulars that do this, that's where the efficiency comes And play. planning also has a what they call the planner of the day, um, somebody that's available at the front, front counter if somebody wants to come and ask specific questions where we will always continue to provide that service to our developers. Okay, so this is round one and we're gonna come Next back week. with uh, the permanent. permanent, okay. Monuments, okay. So just one last comment to wrap up. Um, for anybody watching on Channel 11 that wants to send in any questions or comments, we do invite them to send those in to the email at signinfo at mesaizy.gov. Great.
Thank you very Thank much. You. We appreciate the outreach you're doing to get citizen uh, input, and that won't work unless people do respond. So please, uh, we'll, we'll use this as a commercial. Please do give us your, your thoughts and feelings on this. All right. Thank you. Any other? Are we sure that's the last question? All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Next item on our agenda is item three, <clears throat> which is information pertaining to the current job order contracting projects. Council, do you see anything on that item that you'd like to talk about? Hearing none, the next item is item four, approval of minutes from executive session held on, on November 9th and November 20th. Thank you, Mr. Luna. Thank you, uh, Chris. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Next item is acknowledge receipt of minutes of various boards and committees, and those are listed. Uh, I won't go through them, but uh, 5A through 5E, is there a motion to that effect? I'm sorry, thank you, Mr. Um, Thompson. This was brought up on, by previous councils as well, but is there anything we can do to get the, no, the, the meeting minutes to us sooner? I mean, September to almost February seems it all goes about when the board meets. Right. Is there a so, way that they can do like an electronic review and signature to, to approve it? So, so yeah, we have. And, and sometimes what happens, it's not electronic because then there's a quorum issue. But what we do is we put on the, uh, the agenda, the last item is, is that the chair can approve the minutes. And so you don't have to have another meeting to approve minutes. And so we do do that, um, and, you know, especially like on the trust board in which uh, yeah. only meets once a year. So you literally have to wait another year. So we do that with the trust board. We need to be more proactive on some of these that yeah. meet occasionally um, and, and right. make sure we're it, empowering the It just the seems board like four chair. months is... Uh, yeah. The time you read the yeah. meeting minutes, the you know, it's and, driven by how and approve them. It's it's ancient history. Yeah, it's just when they meet. Okay. So, but we can see if there's another way that the board will get comfortable with letting the chair do. Although sometimes the board, other board members, want to be able to <laughs> vote on it too. So, but we can we can ask. We'll work with those boards and see if we can come up with a way to do that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Chris. All in favor of this is, again, approving uh, receipts, uh, the receipt of the minutes for 5A through 5E. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Next item, oh, I'm sorry, but there was also 5F on the other side of this. Can we amend that motion through 5E through 5F? Yes. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Next item is here reports on meetings and conferences attended. Mr. Luna. Uh, just really quick, um, MD Helicopter had a $1.4 billion sale of military hardware, and the mayor and I had an opportunity to meet uh, the military personnel from Malaysia yesterday. So it's a great meeting, and it was. Uh, hopefully we'll get more <coughs> sales going. That's great. Yes, that's a big deal. Uh, you notice a lot of car cars in the parking lot at MD Helicopter right now. It's uh, congratulations to them on, on their success. Uh, any other reports? Mr. Freeman. I don't have a picture this year, but the uh, mayor was able to uh, ride on a little horse ride uh, on January 27th. So I appreciate him coming out. We had 125 horse riders with people in wagons commemorating uh, the uh, pioneers who came in the Salt River Valley here in the Lehigh area. And, and beyond that, uh, we had a neighborhood meeting. Uh, Council Member Heredia and I sponsored a meeting uh, regarding the light rail uh, crime statistics for the West Mesa area, and it turned out uh, had about 40 residents and a really uh, great panel of uh, professional people. Adrian Reese from Valley Metro came and spoke her perspective, as well as Jody Sorrell. I don't know, Council Member Heredia, you, you want to? It's a great turnout. Um, you know, a lot of great question feedback. So we'll, we'll take, we're taking those questions and feedback uh, to, uh, you know, talk to staff and see what we can do. Yeah, great. Thank you. Please. Thank you. That was a great event in, in Lehigh. Mr. Heredia. And then uh, last Saturday, we had the regional unity walk in Tempe, uh, which I attended. Uh, thanks for staff and uh, Mesa PD, uh, community engagement folks, uh, for being out there. So, <coughs> Thank you for representing us there. We appreciate that. Um, I can't remember why I wasn't there. I had a conflict. I was in another, I think I was out of town. <laughs> I was still, uh, still, still walking around funny from the horse ride. Um, uh, no, it was great. And it, it's great. I'm glad we have Lehigh. It, it, it is yeah. nice to have a rural uh, equestrian uh, part of Mesa. So that was a lot of fun. Other uh, comments on meetings or uh, reports? Hearing none, Mr. Uh, Brady, help us with scheduling of uh, our next meetings. Yes, just to remind council, um, Monday, February 5th, 
Um, there will be a, um, I think it's a short agenda, but there will be a, a Sustainability and Transportation Committee meeting at 4.30. Um, and then that will be followed by a um, council study session and a council meeting this coming Monday. And I know, Mr. Freeman, you've heard, uh, as have I, from our council about uh, the interest in a st strategic planning meeting oh. over the next uh, few right. minutes. Right, and you we have some dates that are being, you'll have in the city manager's update for you to look at <coughs> and just let us know if, um, I guess, let us know if those dates don't work for you. So they'll, we have some dates that will be suggested um, in the um, update today. Great. Okay, great. Okay. Any questions on any of that, gentlemen? If not, is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Thank you, Mr. Luna. Thank you, Chris. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. We are adjourned.